United States ended 20 years of war in Afghanistan, the longest war in American history. We completed one of the biggest airlifts in history, with more than 120,000 people evacuated to safety. the f***ing reality of the world, people. Yeah. Everyone's running out and immediately setting up a 360, and I'm just looking around, and there's like, just calm as can be, like right there on the airfield. And uh, just in that immediate area where we landed, and this like army soldier or this airman walks up with her Kevlar like strapped to her her pack or her plate carrier, walking up to us with a clipboard. Hi guys, welcome to Afghanistan. What all was going, what were you guys' intel briefs that were? Collapse of the government, Taliban fighting, heavy fighting uh, with the National Resistance Front. So how would this have been a non-combatant withdrawal? I think uh, we all wonder that to this day. You're literally witnessing people get executed from all angles. Yeah. Dude, what the f is going on right Dude. now? And then they make the ROEs even more strict on you. Yeah, they, they Who's go. Who's telling you this? Where's the shit coming from? The extraordinary success of this mission. ISIS-K terrorists, sworn enemies of the Taliban, were lurking in the midst of those crowds. And still, the women and men of the United States military, our diplomatic corps, and intelligence professionals did their job and did it well. How desperate these people were to escape the Taliban was this lady. We had to send her back out, out of the gate. And I don't remember who did it, um, but some individuals were taking her back out of the gate, go back into the crowd, and she jumps, like, leaps at the, the razor wire, and starts trying to cut her throat with the razor wire. She was like, if you send me back, they're going to rape me, they're going to torture me, like, kill me, kill me. And like, a couple of Marines grabbed her and prevented her from killing, her, killing herself. But, I mean, that's, that's how bad it is there. Like, she was willing to just slit her throat on razor wire. Can you imagine that? The danger had been building for days. Desperate Afghans trying to get out, U.S. Marines trying to help while securing the Kabul airport. This image is what the bomber would have seen approaching the airport's Abbey Gate on that August afternoon. Masses of people lining a canal. And for the first time, we see the suicide blast itself. 
It is only a few seconds and some 50 yards away, but slow it down and you see a lone figure dressed in black who investigators now say was the bomber. Suicide uh, bomber detonates near Abbey Gate. 13 service members killed, 11 Marines, one sailor, one army soldier, 170 Afghans killed. And three minutes after the blast, a U.S. drone records the catastrophic aftermath. 13 U.S. service members, mostly Marines, killed 170 Afghans by the ball bearings propelled by 20 pounds of explosives on the bomber. Surviving Marines gathering up the wounded and dead and hundreds of Afghans running for cover. Our expertise was disregarded. No one was held accountable for our safety. About 1730, Staff Sergeant Darren Hoover, friend and mentor, came to get me from the tower to go help find an Afghan interpreter in the crowd. First, we'll be covering the rules of engagement during the Afghanistan withdrawal. Rules of engagement, if you don't know, are often referred to as ROEs. Uh, rules of engagement are a directive by a military authority that kind of lays out the circumstances and limit limitations on uh, when and how you can engage the enemy in war or in a military operative. During the Afghan Afghanistan withdrawal, as you will see as the video continues, there were some pretty ridiculous RLEs given. There was a lot of intel that uh, identified the bomber, his look, all the way down to what he would be wearing. And he was identified and vetted by 12 to 15 sets of eyes, and yet the authority to engage that target was denied. And that goes all the way up uh, up the chain of demands. I think that it started with the Obama administration and has continued with the Biden administration. And that's the point of today's video. Um, Tyler Vargas Andrews was is a United States Marine who was catastrophically injured during the suicide bombing in Afghanistan, where 13 Americans were killed, hundreds of Afghanistan civilians were killed. And... He could tell you better than I can. So without further ado, let's go on and get into Tyler's point of view. And he really breaks down how ridiculous the rules of engagement were during that withdrawal. Let me uh, yeah. refresh the audience with some facts on the 26th. So suicide uh, bomber detonates near Abbey Gate. 13 service members killed, 11 Marines, one sailor, one army soldier, 170 Afghans killed just in the blast. 45 U.S. military personnel wounded. You lost your right arm, your left leg, missing parts of multiple organs, 43 surgeries, 54 units of blood, and you still have 13 ball bearings and two pieces of shrapnel stuck in your body. Oh, that is correct. Early morning, excuse me. Yeah, early morning of the 26th, about 1, 1.30, um, we had gotten intel from the Joint Operations Command and our assets uh, coming from, from the JSOG assets that were out there that uh, there was a confirmed suicide bomber in the area traveling with another individual. Um, and they had given us the exact, that they had, the, they told us that they had the exact description of it. And so I'm getting this word from our intel assets. A younger individual, probably clean shaven, uh, wearing a brown mandress with uh, some like black outer garb of some sort and a black bag and uh, traveling with an older individual who um, is probably the guy kind of guiding him to do this. And my first reaction, I was like, how the fuck do we have an exact description of this guy? I was like, who, 
if we have an exact description of this guy and we know that he's coming to Abbey Gate, that means you have a motherfucker watching him. You have someone watching him, someone operating in the AO or who knows where he's going to be. Why are we not stopping him before he gets to us? 12 in the afternoon, um, around there, 12 to 1, we see this guy who fits the exact description, probably about about 300 yards back in the crowd. And he's traveling with an older gentleman. This guy's the only guy that's clean shaven and is not that dirty. Um, he's sweating a lot, but he's he's definitely the anomaly in the baseline. And um, he's wearing a brown man dress, black outer garb, like a vest or something in a backpack, or a backpack or duffel bag. Um, and we're like, man, this looks like this guy. And he was he was quite a ways back. And, and I mean, to get through that crowd, it would take, it takes all day unless, I mean, you're pretty fucking, unless you start really pushing people out of the way and fucking hurting people and stuff. Um, takes, takes a few hours to get from where he was at to the base of our tower. And, um, like, okay, fuck. We get one of the, some of the psyops, the psychological operations guys, individuals, uh, the army guys, they, they come up to our tower and, <clears throat> we show him, show him the pictures that we have and who he is. And I mean, this whole time he's working closer towards us and we pass over the net, like that we've got this, you know, this possible threat and, uh, that we're linking up with the psyops guys to get, you know, another set of eyes on him. And for us, we're like, this is the fuck guy. The psyops guys are like, yeah, that's him. That's the exact fucking description that we have. Like that's, that's who we think it is too. And we're like, okay, cool. And so we pass over the net, that too. We're, you know, requesting engagement authority. I, I mean, me, I was I was spotting. Chaz was on the gun. And then someone else took over for spotting, and I was on the net. I was just on the radio, you know, requesting engagement authority for this individual, giving them the description, getting denied. And uh, then the counter-intel guys, uh, some counter-intel individuals, they came up to our tower, and we showed them the photos as well. So now this is a third, third group of, of individuals. This is like 12 sets of eyes now on, on these pictures. 12 PIDs. Yeah. And they're like, yep, that he fucking fits the description. And so does the old gra older guys traveling with, like, that's who we think he is too. And we're like, all right, well, that's fucking three separate fucking entities that, that think the same exact thing. Um, you know, fucking Dalton, he's always got a saying like, if it walks like a duck, it acts like a duck, it's probably a fucking duck. And uh, I passed it over the net again. Like, hey, we have confirmation for three separate entities. Um, we need to, I'm requesting engagement authority on this individual. American lives are going to be at stake if he continues to fucking come up here. And we had, we had watched him. I didn't get to portray it fully in front of Congress, but we, we were watching him for a couple hours like quite a few hours, still continuously requesting engagement authority. And finally it's like, no, um, like, n like, you, like engagement authority is denied. And I was like, who the, f like, who has it? Or we don't have the, they're like, we don't have the engagement authority to give you. And I was like, we'll send the battalion commander up here. Cause we're going to shoot this guy if you don't. And obviously in our eyes. Right. And I said, I said this to Congress too. I said, even if this was a potential, if this was possible, if it wasn't the guy, the fucking bomber in the crowd is going to think twice about fucking doing what he's about to do because he watched some dude's fucking chest get caved in because he watches the dude just get taken out. He's going to know that we're watching. He's going to know that when he does come into view, we're going to fucking deal with him. We're going to put him down because bad people need to be put down. That's what our job is. and Not what our job is, but that's what we're supposed to do in that situation with those individuals and 300 yard shot is an easy shot to take from a stable platform mm -hmm. with high powered optics and fucking long guns. So not to mention with everything else that's going on yeah. around it. Yeah. All well, the executions, dead babies, women trying to cut their own throats on razor wire. Yeah. That's how bad it is. And, and, and they're denying you permission yep. to take this guy out. On top of allowing the Taliban to come up and work next to Marines. Yeah. And so 
they say, all right, the battalion commander's on his way. At this point, I mean, this dude's closer. He's within like 200 yards, 150 yards an hour, maybe even maybe even closer than that. Um, and <clears throat> the battalion commander comes up, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whited, and he, he comes up to the tower. We show him the photos, and he's just kind of sitting on, you know, the heels of his feet like, well... And we're like, well, sir, do we have your permission to engage? Like we've had counter intel, psychological operations, and, and ourselves, positive ID on this guy. This is the description. And he was like, well, yeah, it does look like it, but I don't have that. I don't have that authority. What's like, this guy's uh, name? Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whited. Um, it's like, I don't have that authority to give. We're like, what the fuck? What the fuck is he doing there then? Yeah. We're like, what the fuck? Then who? What rank is this guy? At the time, he was a lieutenant colonel. Um, and I say, um, myself and Chaz are, both have a have a intense conversation. We're like, who the fuck does have the authority, sir? And he goes, well, I don't know. We're like, what the fuck do you mean you don't? He doesn't know, know his chain of command. No. And this guy has to live with this for the rest of his life. And I'm fucking glad you do, Lieutenant Colonel. You fucking piece of shit. And the thing the thing is too is we got um so he said, I don't know. And uh and, you know, we Chas and I both reiterate, well you need to find out because American lives are at stake and if this is the bomber, a lot of people are going to die. And he leaves the tower, leaving us with the sense that he's going to go get us an answer. And now at this point, it's later in the afternoon. It's like 2, 3 p.m. Um, and this guy disappears into the fucking crowd. We don't get an answer back. It's like I said, the uh, like I said in front of Congress, I'm not, I didn't just throw his rank and name out there to destroy this guy's career. But he's who it started with, and it ended with General Sullivan. And we were told, General Sullivan, and this is me quoting him, he said, that request never got to me. So somewhere between here and here, someone didn't give a fuck. You know what you're doing, Tyler, is you are exposing how weak United States leadership is in the U.S. military. It's yeah. that fucking weak now. And you know when it got that weak? Right after this last election. Everybody that was worth a shit either got fired or pulled out or fucking left because they knew this shit was going to happen. That's what you're doing. You're exposing how weak military leadership is now because yeah. of who's in office. And it's good you're doing that. I appreciate that, Sean. It, uh, it's definitely, like I said, in, in between... In between the battalion commander and and the general Sullivan, it someone didn't give a fuck enough. It's flash and just get hit with this massive wave of pressure, just like sh straight on, and uh, and then I'm like my eyes are, my eyes are closed, my vision's black, and I'm like slowly coming to. My right ear is just like super high pitched ringing. My left ear is muffled, and I can just hear people screaming in the distance. And I, I just, I knew right away, as soon as I like was coming to, I was like, holy fuck. Like I just got fucking blown up and I just, my brain knew instantly. And I, I, my immediate thought was just like disbelief. I was like, there's no fucking way this just happened and I can't see yet. And I'm just like struggling to open my eyes and later to come to find out, I mean, on top of a fucking, you know, 20, 30 pound bomb detonating like five meters away from me someone's CS gas canisters that exploded on all of us. And so on top of the bomb, there's all the CS gas cloud that we're engulfed in. And so none of us can fucking see and are struggling to see. And so I was just like, holy fuck, like I actually just got blown up. And I finally can open my eyes and I'm just like laying on the ground in the dirt, looking to my left and like really close to the fence. Like I, almost, I had almost gotten thrown to like to the fence and, uh, I'm like looking to my left and I mean, there's just where this crowd of hundreds of people was is just flattened, like nothing at all. And 
I could still hear people just fucking screaming in the distance and yelling. And I look to my left, and I mean, one of the first things I see is just fucking Marines laid out, just fucking Desert Marpat fucking next to me. And uh, I was just like, oh, fuck. Like, this really just fucking happened. Next, you'll hear from Mark Geist. Mark was in Benghazi, Libya on September 11th, 2012, when there was an attack on the CIA annex and consulate by a militant group. That's where the U.S. ambassador was killed and three other CIA contractors and United States veterans were killed. In this clip, Mark talks about how the Obama administration absolutely destroyed war fighting and didn't protect the war fighters at all with the new sets of RLEs or rules of engagement. Uh, him and Sean Ryan in this clip also share stories about um, more fighters being bombarded by our government and the government overreach and all of the above. So enjoy. You have that conversation with yourself worried about whether that's the right thing to do or not yeah. to kill somebody else's sheep because it's the freaking mentality that the Obama administration brought into war fighting, you know, and that the green badge or the blue badgers freaking put on you. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, for anybody listening that's going, that's ridiculous. No, it's not ridiculous because the Obama administration railroaded Eddie Gallagher and tried to throw him for pris in prison for life for killing an ISIS terrorist. He also tried to throw in four Blackwater contractors, one for life, th three for 35 years, I believe. Yeah. And they actually served time. Yep. It took, um, it took a pardon to get them out. Yep. And so... And this happened, those are just two examples. This happened time and time again. I mean, I remember being in Lashkar Gah, which was supposed to be the biggest offensive force by the Americans since Fallujah. Right. And I remember when those, ROE, those rules of engagement came out, Obama administration said that if they shoot back at you and if they shoot at you and drop their weapon, you are not allowed to engage. Yep. So he just chopped the legs off of every every U.S. soldier in, in theater. And so it, it that completely was, demoralized all of the U.S. military. I had a good friend that was contracting. It was, uh, I don't know if you were, they had the uh, um, tribal anthropologists mm. that were going out and meeting with tribal leaders. They were people who had doctorates in tribal anthropology in that region and they were going out trying to do that touchy-feely thing with the tribes mm -hmm. and bring them in and he his job was to protect this lady and uh, the guy serving tea instead of bringing tea up had gasoline in there and threw it on their lady and lit her on fire the guy got her put out but she ended up dying so him being the good war fighter that he was I'm going to find that guy the next three days, he was able to track that guy down that threw, that killed her, killed him, got arrested and thrown in freaking Bagram jail for murder. How does that work? It How does that work? It How does did, not work. No. Your job is to protect somebody. You know, that threat's still there. Yep. But, you know, people which goes to Benghazi, all of it. You got people that are in Washington, D.C. making plan, making rules and regulations to freaking dictate what a warfighter is doing on the ground. It's been a long time since we had anybody in charge who actually fought for this country. For this last segment, you'll hear from Sean Ryan. He really gets in depth about his experience with the new rules of engagement that the Obama administration uh, started and the Biden administration has carried on. I hope you guys enjoyed this segment. I really enjoy covering this stuff because it's topics that I feel uh, don't get covered nearly enough. If you guys like this, I really uh, hope you guys would subscribe, hit that like button, and feel free to drop a comment. Thank you. Start to feel like that. Um, you know, I'm going to get my years messed up. I really started to feel like that. I did a deployment with the agency in a in Lashkar Gah. Mm -hmm. And 
that was supposed to be, f- f- from what I was briefed, the biggest offensive force since since Fallujah. And I remember when the ROEs came out. Now I didn't fall under those ROEs. Right. That was that was the Marine, um, the Marines that were going to take that entire. I think it was they were going to take the entire province, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. But I remember when the ROEs came out from the administration at the time, which was the Obama administration's. It was if you are shot at, and the enemy drops their weapon, you're not allowed to shoot back. And when I heard that come out, that was a turning point in my mindset where I was like, these fucking people that we're fighting for give a shit more about our enemy than they do about us. These people are chopping our heads off. They're dismembering us and stuffing our privates in our mouths. They're burning people alive. They're beheading people. They're raping fucking girls. And boys. And they're raping boys. I mean, they. And and this is this is our ROE. What the f- are we doing here? You yeah, know, wh- wh- in half, and it seemed. I mean, you never know because it's the media, right? But and, and they do a great job at propaganda. But you know, and then and then you look at the media, and it they make it appear like everybody in America back home is like for this shit. And it, and 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 you get the feeling like, what the f- am I doing over here, man? These people, they don't even, they don't give a f- if I'm over here. The VA is a disaster. It's a disaster for all these guys coming home. I've told multiple. I haven't told, but that's that's what this show started as is a platform for guys to tell their story. And look at the f- trauma these guys are dealing with when they come home. 